public hearing of the Board of Education of Baltimore County on the proposed FY 2020 operating budget. Today is February 13th, 2019, and this meeting is rescheduled from inclement weather day from February 12th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County and also in honor of the victims, all of the victims of our children and hero teachers that have been lost to senseless violence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? Madam Chair, there are no changes or additions. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss, number nine, collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Our first agenda item is unfinished business. We're first starting with the report on the school day task force. And for that, I ask Mr. Burke to come forward, please. Good evening. Good evening. And as Mr. Burke is coming forward, again, we will start with the report on the school day task force. And then we will um, move into other areas the board members have had questions about. Uh, since uh, the past week or so, we will address uh, staffing standards. We'll also talk about technology support. And we'll also look at um, air conditioning in schools, so we'll begin with the school day, the report on the school day task force. Thank you, Mr. Burke. You're welcome. Good evening, Mrs. Causey, Mrs. Hen, Mrs. White, and the members of the board. My name is Billy Burke, and I am the Chief of Organizational Effectiveness. I am also the facilitator for the school day task force. I'm here tonight to provide information on the work of the task force and to present a task force recommendation to the superintendent that has an impact on the budget. The task force is comprised of 45 members from all stakeholder groups, including students, teachers, parents, BCPS staff, and community members. The task force met seven times from April through December of 2018. We started with a public information meeting and held two additional public comment meetings. Early recommendations were published in September and final recommendations were published in November. The public comment meetings followed each time we published the recommendations. A dedicated email was also available for the community to provide comment without attending the meetings. Sorry. The goals of the task force were to examine the issues surrounding the length of the school day, secondary school schedules, and high school start times, and to make recommendations to the superintendent. Extending the school day was examined because BCPS has the shortest school day in the state and struggles to meet the state required days and hours when we lose days to inclement weather. The state superintendent has requested BCPS address this by increasing the length of the school day. The task force recommendation to the superintendent is to increase the school day by 15 minutes. This recommendation has an impact on the proposed budget. Increasing the school day would also require negotiating a new contract with TABCO. And with that, I'll take any questions you have. 
besides TABCO, would the, would, would the other four uh, organizations that, that we negotiate with be, be impacted? It doesn't really affect their, the length of their work day. Primarily, it's paraeducators, 10-month school secretaries, which also fall under ESPBC and TABCO, and the teachers. Thank you. You're welcome. Mr. Kuhn? So you said it was the shortest school day in, in the state. Um, is it by 15? Or, or is every other school system 15 minutes longer than us? The majority of school systems run at 645. Some a little longer, some a little shorter, but about 12 run at 645. And is there any variation between elementary school, middle schools, and high schools in the length of day? Not in most um, systems, but in some systems, yes. Do you, do you know what they are? I'd have to bring them back to you. I'm sorry I, don't, I don't, didn't bring that chart with me tonight. Okay. Other questions? Mr. Burke, if you could speak to the impact of the 15 minutes extra a day uh, related to inclement weather. I think you'll get more information when Dr. Mayo does his presentation on the school calendar next week, but I could give you some brief information. Every time we add five minutes, um, we gain about 15 hours um, of time that can be used to combat the, uh, the problems around uh, inclement weather. So in 15 minutes, we gain about 48 hours. Okay, so that better allows the school system to meet the hour requ requirement for the Maryland State Department of Education. Yes, ma'am, it does. Because in addition to the 180-day requirement, we also have a number of hours that are required. That's correct. Okay, I just wanted to explain that for uh, <clears throat> some of our newer board members. And it's in one of your budget documents. Uh, and maybe you have the number off the top of your head. I what do. is the fiscal impact? About $25.7 million to increase by 15 minutes. And that's almost all salaries for the people that have to work longer days in their contract. Okay, does that impact benefits or is it purely a salary differential? Salary. Salary, okay, thank you. Are there other questions related to this? Okay, thank you. Thank you. On January 8th, the interim superintendent introduced her proposed, our next item of unfinished business is the work session on the 2020 proposed operating budget. Um, on January 8, 2019, the interim superintendent introduced her proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget, which ties to Blueprint 2.0. A public hearing on the operating budget was held on January 15th, 2019. Um, the agenda item for tonight's work session is the January 8th, 2019 um, proposed budget. This additional work session and public hearing was scheduled for the interim superintendent's January 8th, 2019 proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget. A vote is scheduled on this budget for February 19th, 2019. Once approved by the board, the budget will be forwarded to the county executive on or before March 1st, 2019. So I will ask Mr. Smith, Mr. Saris, and Mr. Tantliff to please come forward to address questions from the board on the operating budget. So with that, again, before they come up, and we want to address some questions right up front, so you can have a seat right there, Maria. Uh, we're going to start with some of the questions that you've presented as board members um, over the past week or so. You've had some questions about staffing standards, um, magnet staffing, special education staffing. You've also had some questions about technology support to schools. You've um, asked questions about um, some of the instructional implications as well as um, air conditioning uh, units. And so we just wanted to address some of those up front and then certainly we'll open it up to questions. Ms. Lowry, in on tonight for Dr. Mayo. You can sit in the middle if you'd like uh, so that we can see. We actually have two other We have folks coming up? Yeah, okay. So um, I'll ask Ms. Schubert and Ms. Um, Rebecca Ryder as well to come up who will uh, address some of the magnet and staffing standards um, that you had questions about as well. So Ms. Lowry, would you like to start? So um, good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Ms. White, 
board members. I'm here this evening to share with you the school staffing allocation process. The Division of um, Research, Accountability, and Assessment. Um, let me see if I can get this to move along. Am I missing something? Can't get it to advance. Thank you. Appreciate it. So the Division of Research Accountability and Assessment provides enrollment projections to the Division of Human Resources late December, early January timeframe. Using the predetermined staffing standards and enrollment projections, the Division of Human Resources allocates staffing for general education classroom teaching positions. The allocations um, are distributed to the principals late January. Um, our executive directors and community superintendents meet with principals throughout the second semester, throughout the summer, as well as into early September to monitor student enrollment and staffing. Here you will see um, what we use for elementary schools. Our elementary schools are staffed with a kindergarten ratio of 22 to 1. Grades 1 through 2 are staffed at a ratio of 22 to 1. And our grades 3 through 5 are staffed at a ratio of 25 to 1. For our secondary schools, middle schools are staffed at 19.7 to 1 and high schools are 20.9 to 1. Here you will see an example of how staffing ratio is applied at a middle and high school, both with the same projected enrollment. The high school receives 67 teachers, the middle school receives 71.1. For this elementary example, the total enrollment projection is 493 students. Applying the elementary staffing standards to the kindergarten projection yields three teachers. For grades one through two, the school will receive a total of eight teachers. And for grades three through five, the school will receive 10 teachers. As previously shared, the executive directors and the community superintendents meet with principals to discuss and review staffing needs. Requests for additional staffing are reviewed by the executive directors, the community superintendents, and the chief human resources officer. Any additional staffing may be allocated based on need and available resources. Some schools may receive above the predetermined staffing standards based on enrollment patterns and trends that we see. There were also questions that were raised as before you get into the magnet staffing um, piece, and I know that Ms. Schubert is here. She's a director in the Office of Innovative Learning and oversees our magnet programming. I think it's important for the public to know and to understand as well as the board to have a, a kind of a brief history of our magnet programming. One of the things that we have found over the last several decades actually, our magnet programs have grown up kind of organically in the system. So if a principal or a community member had an idea about a magnet program, then it would have grown up um, in that community. What we have found is that, and what was found during the Metis audit, I believe that was 2013, Leanne? Um, in 2013, when Metis and Associates did the audit for magnet programming, we found that there were disparities, not only disparities in staffing, but disparities in programming as well. So that you could have a dance program, let's say, on the east side of town, and yet there wouldn't be a dance program on the west side of town. What I've tried to do, and I know that what we've done in the last uh, a couple of years in particular, is to right size that and to make sure that there is access and opportunity across the board. And that is a work in progress, to make sure that programmatically our kids, our students have um, access to those programs on, on every side of the county, as well as in our um, for our central area, our east side, and our west side as well. The staffing, we found that over the decades, and I may be stealing your thunder, Leanne, but there are some comprehensive magnet schools, for instance, that have received 
a great number of staff members and staffing allocations, and where there are other comprehensive uh, magnet schools that didn't receive as much. So we've been trying to level set over the past few years to make sure that, yes, we have everything that we need programmatically, instructionally, to make the program work, um, but then we also have to make sure that everybody has the same access to those staffing allocations and that it's not just one favored school over another, but it's a staffing standard across the board. We have not gone in and ripped out staffing from schools. It might feel like that if you're in a comprehensive magnet and you're used to having a great number of teachers and then we've had to draw down in order to build up in other places. But programmatically, we believe that all of our um, staffing, is uh, all of our students are covered, our programs are covered instructionally. Um, and so we just want to make sure that that is known and understood by the public and by the board even before we get into the staffing standards. So Leanne, I'll let you take it from there in terms of how we staff our schools. Thank you, Mrs. White. So overall, school magnet staffing is driven by changes in student enrollment. Each year, staff and magnet programs meets with staff from Human Resources to share projected changes to overall magnet school enrollment. These changes in staffing allow schools to make changes and adjustments to course offerings in order to support the implementation of our BCPS magnet programs. However, in addition, as Mrs. White mentioned, the Office of Magnet Program also allocates additional positions above and beyond the per pupil allocation to further support our magnet programs. In part, these allocations support each and every magnet school with an at, at least a .5 magnet coordinator. This is a teacher level position and the role of the magnet coordinator includes program recruitment for that magnet program, marketing, professional development for teachers, and ongoing program support. The magnet coordinator position is critical to the success of each and every one of our BCPS magnet. As Superintendent White mentioned, our BCPS magnet programs have grown, grown quite organically. The BCPS magnet team continues to review the staffing needs for each of our programs and is working to develop staffing standards based on the unique of each of our magnet programs. So I understand that there were also questions about special education, staffing, and allocation. Basically, how do we staff our, I believe the question was, how do you staff um, for special education needs, and what are your, what's your um, special education, uh, what are your uh, special education staffing standards? So Rebecca Ryder, here's our director of special education, and she'll go through um, how we do that. that are set forth by MSDE and also in accordance with the regulations of COMAR. So annually, we do submit um, to MSDE our staffing plan by September 30th of each year. So we're currently working on our staffing plan now for next year that will be submitted September 30th of 2019. There are core components of which we consider when developing the staffing plan and which are embedded in our actual um, special education staffing plan, which is online. Uh, we do have to demonstrate um, evidence of maintenance of effort. We also have to include, as part of the special education staffing plan, evaluation of the previous plan. We um, garner fee um, feedback from multiple stakeholders throughout the year, and that's evidence and that's captured within our special education staffing plan. We do receive feedback from administrators. Um, a lot of our feedback we do receive through our special education citizens advisory council, which represents our parents and community group. We also demonstrate um, the evidence of stakeholder input. We also have to include a part of our staffing plan which discusses the staffing patterns and trends that we see to the use of special education teachers, paraeducators, and related service providers. We have to talk about the number and the type of um, related service providers and other support staff that we have um, that are not necessarily a part of the Office of Special Education but support students such as our school social workers and school psychologists. In addition, we have to um, denote the methods that we use for monitoring the assignments of personnel, not just when we allocate the positions, but how we're monitoring that throughout the school year. 
um, the actual number of teachers and paraeducators. And then we also include, because as you know, um, special education is a critical area for us and some of the service providers in particular, such as SLPs, we also include how we um, work very collaboratively with the Department of Human Resources to recruit <laughs> and to maintain our teachers. So that is, um, basically the nutshell of the special education staffing plan. I can share with you, this is a very coordinated effort that is not done in isolation just by the Office of Special Education. We work collaboratively throughout the school year with various departments um, throughout BCPS, including, but not limited to, um, we work very close with the Department of Human Resources, strategic planning, facilities, the new division of climate and safety, because we have to coordinate all of these services with the effort to ensure that our students are receiving a free, appropriate public education. That is really the emphasis of the staffing plan, is to ensure that our students are receiving FAPE. The staffing plan um, in the public school system, also we have to show the continuum of services, and the way in which we allocate our staffing is based upon formulaic ratios. I think it's on the next slide, but that's okay. So we do staff um, for, and I think you've heard through various presentations, we do um, have to provide staffing and allocations to support all of our students, not just our comprehensive schools. We do support um, our youngest learners from birth all the way up to 21, where we have students in our high schools, also in our separate public day schools, and some who are on our college campuses. So we're responsible for the teacher allocation, paraeducator allocation, and the related <laughs> service allocation for all of, um, all of the schools. So we do staff for infants and toddlers. At our infants and toddler sites, we staff the teachers, the paraeducators, and then um, we also work with the other offices to ensure that we have psychological services and health services that are available to our um, youngest learners and our families. Then we have to look at the comprehensive school setting, and that's where we use the phrase continuum of services. And it's ensuring that students in what we call LREA, which is pretty much almost fully included, it's 80% or more of your day, which you're spending in general education classes with the support of a special education teacher, and it looks different for each child because it is an individualized education program that we're looking at. So when we're talking about LREA, um, a special education teacher could be supporting a student in the classroom directly and working with small group instruction. The teacher could be co-teaching in a classroom. The teacher could be working um, in a collaborative planning session, more in like a consultative manner with a general education teacher. So that would be our LREA, and that is a 16 to 1 ratio, which is comparable with most LEAs. LREB is used as another formulaic ratio of 14 to 1, and that's um, 49 to 70 uh, percent of 40. 40 to 79 percent of your day um, is inside and outside general education. So a student could um, have their services met inside general education for part of the day or for a class, and then they might be receiving some services, what we call outside general education, and that would be provided by a special education teacher. We also look at other um, service providers, such as um, a reading specialist or or in, um, a parent educator could work under the guidance of a teacher. So it really depends on how that service is clarified on the child's individualized education program. It's a very individualized process. LREC is a 10 to 1 ratio, and that is um, where it's mostly a self-contained type of setting, but it could be provided in a student's home school, in a comprehensive school. Um, at that point in time, these are all decisions about where does a child receive his or her services is determined by an IEP team. The IEP team, inclusive of a special education teacher, a general education teacher, many times a school psychologist, um, an administrator designee, which is usually an assistant principal, are the core members of a special education team that determine what those service hours look like. Um, and then that's when the school staff would kind of utilize their, their services within the building. If a team has determined that a student's needs cannot be met in his or her home school, then we would look at regional options that we have throughout um, Baltimore County. We, you might have heard some of the terms um, social emotional learning program, communication learning support program, functional learning support program. Um, each team would look at different um, decision making tools to see whether or not a, a student's needs could be met at their home school. If not, then we would look at a school that would be hopefully closest to his or her home school, and that would be staffed through regional model. That would be a one teacher, one paraeducator, and one social emotional learning, formerly known as behavior interventionist, would be the staffing that we would allocate to that school. 
then um, the most restrictive place that we have within the public school setting is considered a separate public day school, and we have four of those in our county. We have Battle Monument, we have Main Choice, Ridge Ruxton, and we have White Oak. So a team could make a decision that a child's needs would best be met at our um, separate public day school, and our office is um, responsible for the allocation of all of the staff within a separate public day school because it's considered a special education um, site. So that's really how we um, allocate. It is a continuous process throughout the year and how we allocate to each school. Um, each January, the, the principals receive their, their staffing. Again, that's based off of the December count. They get their staffing in January, and then their staffing, um, they have to do work within their school than to ensure that they're um, addressing the service hours of our students, whether it's a student who is receiving their services inside general education, a resource room model, or is mostly self-contained. So as you can see, again, I know that the emails that come in, it's uh, from board members, it's, you know, what's the staffing uh, standard? And it's not necessarily an easy thing just to type back. Mm -hmm. It is a very complicated and complex um, a process when it comes to staffing standards overall in terms of the general classroom saturating um, when it comes to our Wagner staffing and our special education sta uh, staffing based on need and uh, and I'd like to ask uh, if the board members have any questions at this point in time and also like to thank all of the people who go into um, this uh, creating the staffing standards and all of those folks in the magnet task force that have been so uh, over the years as well as CCAC and members of the public who contribute to this process and uh, who would like to start off with questions? Mr. Offerman, then we'll work on uh, Yes. Uh, my question uh, is when a school uh, that is uh, set for a certain number of students, it's a general staffing question, uh, has an uh, unusually high increase of, of students who attend based on the previous year's expectation, uh, what, if anything, is, is being done to, to help that school or to, to assist that school to, to, to receive some, some additional uh, instructional help. Certainly. So um, when the process um, works perfectly, usually what you find is that the projected enrollment is spot on. But there are sometimes some anomalies that you don't anticipate. And we find that information out. Um, usually we either hear from the community soup that is meeting with the principal, or we may hear directly from mm -hmm. Um, from draw that they've gone back they've taken a look at a particular school because they've gotten some information and they will provide us an update um, as well as we will often hear directly from um, draw that they've they've looked at a school they have some additional information that is not going to be found anywhere on paper but because of um, some information that they may have about a community changing or some additional growth that was not previously counted in, they are recommending that we make an adjustment um, to that particular school. So um, that's not unusual. There is, there is no staffing formula that you could ever come up with that would be perfect. Um, it, it requires talking across um, and, and being able to move um, in all directions to address this because ultimately our goal is to make sure that we're providing our principals with what they need to, to be able to run the programs in the building and um, to be able to have the appropriate staff to meet the, the various needs um, as well as the programs and especially that um, would be needed for, for staff. So we, we adjust all the time. And that occurs sometimes during the school year? Yes, the majority of it um, happens really between um, the first part of March all the way through the end of August. So for example, um, you could have a school that all of a sudden they get this influx of kindergarten students. And that information is coming to us um, we're meeting all throughout the summer on a regular basis um, to receive that information from the executive directors and community soups that are monitoring student enrollment. So when we see that, we have to immediately make some adjustments. Sometimes that is um, taking a look at a school that for whatever reason was came in under enrolled and um, we have to check that we don't immediately pull a position from that elementary school and move it, but if we're certain that nothing is going to change, um, there may be a position that is moved. 
um, and it's typically moved before um, the, the teachers begin, before the students step foot in the door, um, and then we work with the principals, the executive directors to help them make those adjustments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my question was in regards to the magnet programs that are um, at the schools. Um, and I thank you for that explanation as to how they're chosen and everything. I was curious as to if there was any community input when deciding which magnets were going to be at which schools pertaining to um, the needs of specific areas. And um, if you also looked at how job projections factored into that, jobs of the future, and then looking at that, the community, and how that would factor into choosing what magnets go where. Thank Certainly, Ms. Scott. So in um, 2013, the task force engaged in uh, multiple sessions of feedback with our stakeholders. Um, if I remember correctly, we had eight scheduled sessions with the blizzard in the middle, <laughs> um, asking folks many questions about magnet programs, including um, looking at that K-12 progression, but also looking at those post-secondary um, education opportunities and post-secondary employment opportunities. And that feedback was invaluable as we looked at not only our existing magnet programs, where they were located, and as Mrs. White suggested, perhaps where they need to expand, um, but it also helped us identify some programs that perhaps were no longer meeting the needs of um, in that process, stakeholders inform us of what they see as those needs. Um, and then in terms of establishing those new programs, we then go back and then work with many offices when we're looking to put a program in place. Um, we look to identify a school in an area that has um, a gap in magnet programming, but we also have to ensure that the school has the ability to draw students at magnet students, these are students not necessarily zoned for that school who are coming across attendance boundaries. So we have to ensure that we're identifying a school that and then those increases in enrollment would then um, drive those staffing changes. I actually have two questions. Um, the last board meeting, a number of people spoke about the situation at Milford Mill Academy. And I think twice we heard that they have classes in excess of 40 kids in a class. And Ms. White provided a chart of how staffing was allocated to Milford Mill based on en enrollment over a period of years. And I don't have it with me, I'm sorry, but if, if I remember correctly, the enrollment dropped and the teacher ratio seemed to go up each year. So I'm trying to understand how we end up in a situation in any school where we would have 40 kids in a class. I, I can speak to that. So um, particularly in schools where we have magnet programs, new programs that are, that are beginning, um, you may need to start out with small enrollment in that particular program because you're building it over time. So you receive a set amount of um, staffing allocations that you then have to, to plug into um, your schedule based upon student requests. So th we operate with, with terms like singletons, doubletons. You have one section of one particular course. And when a student needs that particular course, it then drives the rest of their schedule. If I have to take this dance class first period on an A day, because it's the only period it's offered, it locks me into when I can take everything else. So sometimes that has a negative impact on some sections. So some English sections would bump up, and you would see that within that particular section of English, probably the majority of the students are the ones that take this dance class, because then there are other things that they get locked into in their schedule. You then have certain classes that are doubletons where there are only two sections of that course offered. And all of those pieces then rub up against the, um, the sections and the class size. But you would then look across the schedule and you may see other sections. You've got this one of 40 in an English 11, but then you may have um, another English 11 where there are only 21 students. And logic would tell you 
move some of the students into the one that's 21, but there may be something that's rubbing up against the schedules of some of those students that prevent them from being able to move into that particular section. So that's why we have to continually work together and when we find those things happening, what can we do together to work with that school, whether it's helping them to strategize to, to help with the schedule to avoid that, or is it that we're sharing points of teachers so that a teacher is shared between a couple of schools to help balance some of that? There are a variety of things that, that have to be looked at to, to see how you can solve that. Some of those um, anomalies don't take place until um, well into the school year. Students move in, students change schools, um, something gets dropped or all of a sudden second semester they appear um, and you didn't anticipate it when you built the schedule. So um, again, there's not a perfect plug and play to it, but we have to continue to work together and not um, operate in those silos when it comes to staffing, to building schedules, to trying to address those issues because when you do, um, you you could wind up like you you had mentioned. It seemed like the um, the enrollment changed, but the staffing didn't, or it can happen vice versa. We certainly um, need to make sure that we're utilizing our staffing as best we can. It is much easier to make a switch early on, um, prior to the school year in an elementary school. But secondary, once you build that schedule based upon what the students request, you really get locked in. And you can't, you can't just pull one staff member because when you pull one math teacher from a secondary school, now it impacts every other content area in that school because you, you've now adjusted that whole schedule. So, we all have to continue to, to communicate and talk and as early as possible so that we can try to address um, those concerns. And um, when, when we hear about those class sizes going up, um, we, we've got to all pitch in to help problem solve it because there's not a, there's not a one size fits all to, to address some of those issues. And based on what Ms. Lowry just said, again, that's the reason why you saw the chart where the staffing didn't go down um, dramat dramatically, right? Because, because of that type of situation to support the school so that even though the enrollment is dropping in a secondary school and a high school, it's very complicated then to actually then to remove, yes. remove the staffing. I know that we are running short on time, so we have to keep our answers pretty succinct. I just have one more question about special ed. So in a perfect school year, kids come in and at some point kids who were not identified as being special education, students with special education needs are identified with that. It, how often does that happen in BCPS? How, how many kids are identified within the school year needing special education? Sure. I don't have that exact number for you, but um, as you indicated, there's so many variables that come in play when we're um, talking about special education enrollment. In some cases, it could be an initial eligibility for a student that a team has met and they have determined that this net child now needs special education services. In some cases also where we actually saw um, a slight increase and that was um, an unanticipated increase that we saw, we were receiving many students who were new to county. So that was something that was a little bit of a challenge that we received many more students new to county um, requiring services outside general education. Um, so it, it does happen, um, and then we can, as um, Ms. Lowry said, we can adjust accordingly, sometimes with additional positions if needed. Um, that has happened. Sometimes it is after a budget is approved and we're fortunate enough to receive additional positions, we're able to allocate some then. Um, sometimes there's adjustments that we provide um, to a school, for example, from central office support. In some cases, our office will visit a school and work very closely with the school-based team um, for providing like technical assistance support and looking at scheduling and looking at the existing um, services that they have and maximizing the services that they have too. Um, so it does happen. Happen, but it looks it's very unique to each I'm school. Sure. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank You're you welcome. all. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Ryder. And just to point out that in addition to staffing, we're also going to be speaking about uh, air conditioning and also technology support. So if we can keep our questions um, macro in nature mm -hmm. and quick, that would be great because I know I've got other uh, board members that also want to uh, ask questions. Thank you, Ms. Hen, and then Ms. Pasture. 
Thank you, Mrs. Causey. And in the interest of time, I have two questions and a request, but if you feel like you can't sufficiently answer the questions here, then a written response to the board would be fine. So I appreciate your time. My first question has to do with magnet enrollment. Um, I've heard from many magnet faculty concerns that enrollment is capped because of inadequate staffing, even though there is available capacity in those magnet programs, um, and that there are adjacent schools who are short on capacity. So my first question has to do with how are we looking at magnet programs in schools with excess capacity and providing extra staffing so that students can take advantage of those opportunities, particularly because adjacent schools where they might otherwise attend are overcrowded. Sure, when uh, we work annually with principals in collaboration with uh, strategic planning to look at um, projected um, capacity within a building and then work with principals to set the enrollment numbers. So those enrollment numbers aren't driven by staffing, they're driven by the capacity of the building. Does the, the building hypothetically have uh, the ability for 100 new students to come in across bound? At that point, Magnet Programs works with human resources to indicate the increase in the number of students who are coming that would then drive staffing. But it's the building capacity that initially, initially drives that enrollment, not staffing. So building capacity would also drive available Magnet openings? But I'm, I'm not hearing that from our Magnet faculty. I'm hearing that there is excess capacity, but that Magnet enrollment has been capped because of a lack of academic staffing, and I'm curious no, as to how that would be. Staffing doesn't drive that process. It's um, Many times it has to do with building capacity, and also we've heard from our magnet schools that because of the specialties that are involved, um, we do want to make sure that class sizes are reasonable for magnet um, teachers um, in these specialized programs because of all that's involved in um, a culinary program or a visual arts program and all of the, the special requirements that students have to, um, to master um, in that program. So it is not the staffing that drives that, it's the building capacity and the specialty itself. So the comment that if we only had more English teachers, we could offer up more magnet opportunities to more students is not an accurate observation by our magnet faculty. I don't believe it is. Okay, thank you. My second question has to do with our general education staffing standard. And there was some language that was a little unclear that um, some folks have asked me about. Um, and that is the calculation in the, the formula itself that refers to reducing, and I'll just read an example for elementary classroom teachers, the allocation of grade one and two teachers is determined by adding the grade one and two projected enrollments at the school, reducing this sum by the comparable proportion of the special education regional enrollment, and then dividing this by 22. My question has to do with that reduction by the comparable proportion of special education regional enrollment and the feedback I've gotten is that those students are frequently in general education classes and why are we reducing the production projected enrollment by that population and why aren't they included in the calculation? That would be one of those questions that you referred to that would take a little bit more time. So I could certainly get that information to um, Ms. White to get to you. Thank you. Sure thing. And my last question, or rather request, is could the board receive a report of our actual class sizes relative to our staffing standards to see where we are? Because, again, you had mentioned, mm -hmm. Ms. Lowry, that um, our sizes in excess of the standard are the exception, and that's not the feedback that we're getting. And I think the community could use help in understanding why class sizes aren't reflective of the standards that are published. Well, I, I think the the one piece that's important to, to keep in mind is that um, staffing standards are not class size recommendations. So um, what one teacher does not equate to um, a set class limit. So that 25 to one is how it's determined how many staff are needed for that particular grade level, for example, in elementary school, but that does not drive a recommended class size. So those are two different pieces of information. So that would be helpful to have a follow-up report presented to the board to, so that we can better understand the relationship between staffing standards and class size, and if that information could be provided to the public as well, because that's a point of confusion that I think we could use clarity on. 
Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Ms. Pasteur. Thank you. And mine might need a little bit more. And so I'm going to direct my question to you, Mrs. Lowry, and you knew I would. Um, I, I thank all of you in advance for the comments that you've made about working together and processing the changes that go on. I certainly wish that had happened when I was a principal, because it never did. So my question is now just um, something firm about what the process is, because again, when we talk about the student to teacher ratio, people often think that that's what they're going to see when they go into the school. But the reality is that that number is based on all of your um, faculty members, your teaching staff. So then that will very likely mean that you won't see that kind of balance from class to class, because we're not talking about how many English teachers do you need, how many, et cetera. And so if I use Mr. McMillian as an example, who was an athletic director, when the staffing is, uh, is done, he is in that count. Mm -hmm. But he might not be teaching a class, mm -hmm. or he might only be teaching one class right. that really does not help to reduce numbers in physical education or anywhere else in the building. Um, so that needs to be clear mm -hmm. in that manner, and also in terms of magnet programs. So I'm wondering, and again, you might that might be something that you will have to write out, what is being done now to account for that kind of situation, number one. Number two, in those schools that get after September 30th, an influx from somewhere, from another county or from a group home, because we do know that some of our schools get more group home students that are not accounted for when we are doing, unless they've been there before and they're entrenched in that community, that are not accounted for when you're doing the staffing count. Also, take asking, someone asked the question about special ed, understanding that you have to use that special ed staffing for special ed. However, you might be processing, when you're doing your schedule, putting a particular special ed teacher in a self-contained environment, only to find that you have those who need inclusion services that you didn't know you were going to have or that weren't accounted for in scheduling. So now you have to be able to juggle how you move that teacher out of self-contained to at some point during the day to go in inclusion. Because you've got to keep, by law, the self-contained numbers where they should be. So I would like, if you will, to just get some feedback about now how we will accommodate those kinds of shifts, mm -hmm. those kinds of um, things that will happen in many of our schools, or maybe from time to time in some of um, the other schools that we're not counting on particular populations like that, because that does impact on how many chil how many teachers, no, okay, children, how many children we will end up having, and that classroom sizes might well shift. So what do we do, particularly from human resources, to handle so, some yes. of those issues? Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. And certainly we can get provide the board with more detailed information in writing um, this week in the Friday update. But a couple of things that I want to, to mention. First of all, um, Dr. Brown, our uh, projections. I do think it's important for us to look at the accuracy of our projections because I think that's important for the public to know as well. I'm always trying to get away from the mic and somebody <laughs> seems insistent always to have one. Um, so our projections over time. Um, 
Some of you may recall uh, about four years back, uh, we partnered with the county and SAGE policy group to, to review and, and uh, produce our projections. And that was done in part to, to um, help us leverage data from the county uh, for that purpose so that we could be forward looking with that, as well as to review and have a systematic and very public uh, process for how we do that. We tend to use an industry standard for those. It's called cohort survival. It's, it is the industry standard for that methodology. And for each of the past four years, we've been well over 99% accurate uh, on a one-year projection. Where we've seen our biggest gains or improvements is, well, we're well over 99% accurate for year two, and we're over 99% accurate for year three, and we're close to 99% accurate for year four now. <laughs> so we've seen substantial improvements in the accuracy of our projections. Um, which then provides the basis, again, for the number of staff that we need for the system as a whole, which then are allocated out to buildings. Now, that being said, um, when we start looking at individual buildings, we will see some variation in that. And, and that will never, I, I, there, I mean, a projection is a projection. I don't care how much we use forward-looking uh, data tied to housing developments and yield from housing developments to inform that. There will always need to be a human component in staffing schools. And, and that's where we look to our community superintendents, where we look to, to folks in HR to help us make those adjustments after the fact um, for changes, historical changes, et cetera, to enrollment that we did not anticipate. So, and that's where I just want to jump in there because I do want to, to let the board know that that is the process in terms of that human interaction. So we do rely on our projections in order to make the uh, recommendations, particularly for the, the staffing, our schools. But then when things happen, and we notice that it happens, uh, and, and I've been involved in this now for uh, several years, particularly at the kindergarten level. Um, and so it seems to me that over year after year, we have an influx of kindergartners um, that where we need to make sure that we are accounting for in terms of having a quality, a quality teacher in front of all of those um, students. And so the, the executive directors and the community superintendents will bring those recommendations to me. The principals submit. There is a process for them to complete uh, that um, staffing request form. They give it to the community superintendents who bring it to me with the prioritized list. We meet with the Department of Human Resources and then we provide that additional staffing um, at that time once we see that there is an influx of students for any particular reasons. But, um, reason, but pretty much our projections are pretty much spot on. Thank you. And now we're moving to Ms. Rowe. All right. So there's one particular school and this has been the situation for Pleasant Plains for almost 10 years that I followed it. I've looked at the projections, I've looked at the current enrollment, and several times a year I call the school and I ask the principal, how many students go to your school? So today, according to the principal, there are 702 students at Pleasant Plains Elementary. And when I look at the September 30th number that you have here, it's 667. And I'm concerned that if the staffing projections, or if the enrollment projections for next year are based on this 667, and the principal's telling me that every single year they have at least 30 children who enroll after September 30th, and I'm looking back in the future at the projections, and Pleasant Plains is not projected to be at 700 students ever. The highest it gets in the projection is 692 in 2021, but this 18 actual for next year staffing is going to be based on 686, and there are right now 702 students. So my concern is that we have these books and we have these numbers, but if this is happening every year and if it's happening at multiple schools, we could potentially have hundreds of students that are never in any of the counts. And that's state and federal money that we're not getting for those students. And I would like to see for us to every January update these counts so that we can make sure that in the following September that we're basing the staffing on what the enrollment of the previous year really was. Or at the very least so that we can know what those counts are because 
to me, it seems like if you have this situation where every year you can go in in the middle of the year and update the staffing, but there's 702 students in that school this year. And the principal's telling me that they don't really lose students, they just get more. So they're gonna start in September with 702 more students, except this says it's not. And I've looked at this school every year and every year this particular school, the projections are off by anywhere from 20 to 50 students. Every single year you can call, and the community is very frustrated by this because you're looking at a school now that's 138% over capacity, and that school's being told based on numbers in these books that, oh, you don't need an overcrowding solution because you're not projected to be over capacity for very long. For 10 years this has been going on. So I just, I'll just start with, with that. And, and uh, Pleasant Plains is, is a school that is one of the examples of schools that we have um, uh, allocated additional uh, staffing to, to Pleasant Plains. I know that they have additional behavioral support. They have additional, at this point, administrative support and special education. Support and, yes, um, and we actually use the January services yeah. as well, and we have never said that they don't need a um, uh, um, boundary kind of or uh, mm -hmm. um, relief uh, strategy. We know that they need a relief strategy, and that is something that we'll be bringing to the board um, as we get closer to that to that point. Um, but I will, we can provide more detailed information again uh, in writing to the board. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kuhn, and then we're going to we're, we have two more. Uh, issues to cover technology support and also air conditioning. So if we can quickly move to. I'm, I'm mindful of the time. Thank you. Thank you for all the information. It's been very valuable. Um, Milford Mill Academy, uh, Mrs. Huey's class, she came here, she spoke to us at the last meeting and said she had over 40 students. So I would like a specific answer about, specifically about either the scheduling issue that is causing that or what steps we can take to address that. And I don't know if steps have been taken since then, but um, it was headline news for us. So I'd, I'd like to understand it better and, and see what we can do. And then um, for Dr. Brown, you mentioned that we're 99% on for for our projections, but when you're talking about over 100,000 children, that's over 1,000 children that we're missing or not accurate on. So it's a significant number as we go forward. And I do applaud 99%, you know, it's a very the, good the score. The average uh, across the last three years is 258 off. Okay, it's always good to, to understand that. Uh, when I said 99%, I was really being conservative. It's 99 plus. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So at this time, I would ask um, Mr. Corns and uh, Dr. Adams to come forward. I know, again, gentlemen, we are a little short on time, but I would, I, I have asked them to bring forth, uh, there have been questions about technology support and if you could just briefly describe our uh, technology support model and uh, for the board members and for the public. Sure, we can be expeditious. Uh, Chairman Cosby, uh, Vice Chair Han, and uh, Superintendent White. Uh, we have brought forward two slides for you this evening um, about our support model that we have in BCPS. Um, this technology support model is designed around our, our school. We have um, a call center that allows our staff to call in to receive support or have tickets routed. Uh, we have a systemic uh, help desk system that allows our staff uh, to put in tickets for um, not only technology but also facilities uh, requirements. Uh, we have uh, worked diligently this year to uh, ramp up our self-help uh, for staff to be able to and students to be able to uh, provide a first line for themselves. Um, we also uh, have piloted a student-run help desk this year in uh, multiple high schools that has been highly successful where students at the high school level are actually working through our CTE program to provide on-site tech support for staff. and. So students. Um, we have a robust vendor repair, uh, a vendor repair and a local repair shop that we uh, work in between to have our issues uh, of uh uh, of uh, repair uh, completed through. We have um, worked to have loaners available as needed, and uh, we are working on a team model of our 
of our technicians, uh, which uh, currently we have a 1 to 1.8 technician to school ratio. And at um, the request of the superintendent, we are increasing our technicians by 12 to provide a single technician at each high school and large uh, secondary building so that we can make support feel like support. Um, so I'm going to move on to uh, I thought I was going to move on. Jeremy, can you bump me to the next slide, please? So we, we wanted to um, also articulate our support model to our staff in a way that was not a circle because there was no way to get on the on-ramp. So we model uh, a, our support triangle after the RTI model, or response to intervention, so that we could resonate with our educational staff. Um, so our initial support would be the things that you could do either locally in the building or by yourself. So the idea of uh, let's turn it off and turn it back on. Have we, is there someone that I could talk to that may have had an experience like this before? Uh, have I talked to my te technology liaison that's in my building? Um, and if those things don't work, then we move on to let's call the help center or put in a BCBS serve ticket. And then, then at that point, my staff gets involved in DOIT and we work on our repair shop, our vendor support, our loaners who are issuing a technician to come to the building. So Mr. Corns, just to clarify your sure. presentation, uh, 12 more tech personnel are included in the fiscal year 2020 operating budget or they're being brought in this year from um, we, this current we we, year's we have budget. currently interviewed for and are bringing them on on um, online uh, now, very very soon yeah <laughs> right now again our schools have said to us they were pretty clear and they probably I'm sure they've been pretty clear with you as well they needed more help and more support this year and so we've done that we've provided mm -hmm. additional help and support. Um, right now, we're interviewing uh, right now to get that additional support into schools. And so we didn't have to necessarily put that in the proposal. Correct. We're able to um, to utilize and to reallocate resources to be able to do it now with the funds, existing funds that we have. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, question for Ms. Hen. Thank you, Mrs. Kazi. Good evening, gentlemen. Thank you for the presentation and your responsiveness to the board on this issue. Um, could you please walk us through, let's say a student has a fatal hardware issue okay. um, in the classroom. It's affecting instruction. It's real-time mm -hmm. laptops DOA. Can you, using your support model, can you talk us through what does that look like operationally and what would the process be and who does what when? Okay. So if we were to walk through our support model, we, we would start off by saying whether or not it's somebody's going to look at it and say this is completely failed. Like, uh, I'm, let's go with a crack screen, and that's a, probably a, the easiest thing. Fell off the desk, the screen is completely shattered, okay? So then in that point, uh, we would move into uh, either the local tech, tech liaison. Some of our buildings have individuals who are doing that as a... Like they're, that's one of their primary roles. Uh, or there would be a BCBS serve ticket that would be entered in. Um, we have a turnaround time on average of about a day to get to the building to correct that. Um, it, our repair shop is, um, depending on if parts are available or not, we, we may have a longer amount of time to fix that specific laptop, but my staff is designed to issue a loaner laptop until the device comes back. Um, I would love to say that that happens seamlessly every time. Um, we have 115,000 kids, so I know that you can give me an example of a time that it didn't succeed, but we've had uh, pretty strong uh, feedback that we're getting um, our, our repairs done in a timely manner. Um, our, our model moving forward is we've been working to issue a small group of laptops to each school so that there's something locally that can be handed to a child. Um, so that's, that's where we're bolstering for next year as well. Okay, so some of the information I'm getting, and I'm very pleased to hear that there are improvements and that we're adding additional resources, and there are always going to be exceptions. Sure. But some data that I've gotten about one large middle school in particular as of December, there were 200 outstanding tickets for mm -hmm. support of devices that were pretty much inoperable at that time. Mm -hmm. I was also informed that there were 10 loaners um, I assume they were all issued um, sure. of those 200 students that were affected. So there is a great need, and I only bring this up to point out what you probably already know, that there is a great need. Mm -hmm. But I am particularly concerned that we're providing adequate funding for 
adequate support and are we there and because that's unacceptable. We're, we're seeing turnaround times of 30, 60, 90 days for these devices and when they are so central to instruction, that's a real problem and without the adequate um, help and I'm interested in your support model because we're also asking teachers, um, one, to put in the tickets as I understand it um, for students, holding students responsible for following up on those tickets. Um, so there's a, there's a concern in the support process there that students are getting the, ad, and teachers are getting the adequate support that they need and that we're addressing these turnaround times appropriately because to, for a student, again, for the laptop, the device to be inoperable for that long of time is unacceptable. So I, I would, um, I can speak to a large middle school that I know of um, and say that uh, we've also issued um, in, in several instances, when ticket counts get very high, we have stationed um, in between two and nine techs at that particular building on a daily basis, rotating in and out. Um, we have been working to bolster up their loaners, and um, we're working on a multiple support plan for um, buildings that have exhibited um, uh, issues that are outside of our normal range. So um, we, we are cognizant of, of the concerns in all of our buildings, and uh, I will I will echo your sentiment that this this device is integral to our instructional practice, and we are working diligently every day to make sure that it is available at, all the time. And what are the status of the loaners currently? I was at a high school earlier today and was told by faculty they have no loaners, and it's one of our, our larger high schools. So are you in the process of rolling out those additional devices to, or can you speak to that, please? I was thinking, Mr. Corns, if we wanted to speak about, um, this is one of the benefits from the superintendent's proposal about shifting devices at the elementary level, because we'll be able to buy or lease devices at one, excuse me, one third of the cost, we'll be able to also purchase or lease more loaners that will be available in schools. The other thing we would benefit from if this proposal goes through is we'll ha we have devices right now in elementary school that we just started leasing, so those devices wouldn't necessarily necessarily be returned, but we could shift those up to the secondary levels where students still need those Windows powered devices to have more loaners in the building and more loaners on call. I don't know if I'm speaking out of turn, uh, but that so, was I know so, part of what so we discussed. To, to Dr. Adams' point, um, we have a uh, not a large number, but a, an adequate number uh, with the current proposal that would be able to be shifted to really bolster up the number of uh, devices that would be able to be loaned out at any time without incurring any additional cost uh, in the FY20. You, and if Mr. I may Corn clarify, so our high school enrollment did not include loaner devices for it, those schools? No, no it, it did. It just, the, the adequacy of the total number that we need Ms. Hen, is, is in flux. Uh, when you look across our entire fleet of devices, we have schools that have very high ticket counts. We have schools that have hardly any ticket count. And so it really is, is site by site. That's, that's why this is a very, um, I, I don't think we've presented anything this evening that's uh, not a complicated issue when it, you really boil it down. But what I'm saying is when, when I hear that we don't have enough loaners in a school, then that's uh, something we need to directly address. So I, I am looking to make sure that we have all of the things that we need in place. And so at the end of it, um, we have loaners, but whether or not we have you know, more than enough or the number that makes the school feel comfortable with, with loaners, that, that's where we need to be. I think what would be effective, thank you, Mr. Corns, is to put in the weekly update the current number of loaners per high school and the new plan if the proposal goes through, sure. um, what that means in terms of uh, moving the um, Windows devices up mm -hmm. and then having the Chromebooks in the elementary school. Not only the cost savings, but also structurally, how does that work? Mm -hmm. uh, and then what does that gain for the system in terms of the number of loaners? Because it's a complicated issue, as you stated, and um, so that would be better presented in writing. Sure. So if we can move um, uh, Ms. Pasture and then Ms. Rowe. I'm sorry, Ms. Ms. Scott. Ms. Ms. Scott. Makita I'm Scott. At Ms. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Yeah, um, basically, uh, what my question was is, as I was looking at this, I like the where it says student-run help desk and um, things like that. I wanted to know, um, probably this would be more so like for the high school students, um, if there was any sort of technical training, such as like certifications, like um, A plus or or Network Plus, like where they were getting this experience running a help desk and um, getting a hands-on um, uh, support from staff and everything. 
everything. But then if that was translating maybe to any sort of like certification that they could actually graduate with and use once they leave high school. So um, with our CTE programs, we already have students that are in these types of programs. My son graduated as an IT major from Western Tech and is now studying that in college. So we already have students having those experiences based on their coursework. Um, we he graduated. Also, he, he was able to get a certification prior to graduating high school? He did not. He um, made some different choices. Oh. <laughs> but it was so available to he, him, It was though. available to there him. There we go. Okay. <laughs> you know, teenagers. Uh, so <laughs> he's probably, I hope he's not watching right now. If my phone buzz, I'll know, if my phone buzzes, I know it's him. Um, so what we also know happens in our high schools is our high schools work really hard to give even students who aren't in CTE programs what they call teaching assistant opportunities. Mm -hmm. And so... For example, I know my daughter, who was in a different program, became a teaching assistant um, as her schedule released before she started doing internships, where she provided additional support to students and adults at the high school where she attended. So um, as we've looked at other school systems that, hi, mm -hmm. hey, buddy, um, mm -hmm. as we looked at other school systems that have implemented devices and we've seen their student-run help desk, we saw it even in middle schools. Oh, in some of the um, districts that we visited, right? So we're very excited about the opportunity of leveraging student interest mm -hmm. with student um, agency with our um, intact instructional programs. And I'm so happy Ms. Shea has come up like <laughs> superwoman. I just wanted to add that we do have five Cisco networking programs that can result in that industry credentials, and part of our budget request is about um, funding support for students to be able to take those um, exams. Mm. And then we have six schools, Pikesville, Delaney, Catonsville, Lansdowne, Hereford, and Perry Hall that have the student-run help desks, which is new for us. So um, we're really excited about growing those opportunities for the real-time training, and let's be honest, usually they're better than we, we are right? at, um, at doing that. <laughs> so those are yeah. two very real opportunities that students would have on the job training that could lead to industry credentials. That's awesome, and that's uh, to me, shows like that's futuristic thinking. It's beneficial to the students to graduate with a diploma, a certification, and then having opportunities to go right into the workforce or go to college and the workforce. So that's um, that's good to hear. Thank it's you our, for sharing that. It's our gift with purchase. With purchase, yep. <laughs> Ms. Rowe? So I'm not really sure exactly who to do. I might be asking you, Ms. White. Okay, so here's my question. My daughter's in middle school, mm -hmm. and she's very faithful with her device. She brings it home. She charges it. She does everything right. Mm -hmm. But sometimes she runs into a problem where she's supposed to be doing work, she's brought her device home, she'll connect to our Wi-Fi, and there's something on that back end that's not working. And then I have a kid who's having a nervous breakdown because she thinks her teacher's gonna give her a zero or something, and I have to say your teacher's not trying to fail you, and blah, blah, blah. But is there a way to report those difficulties to have a ticket so the child has proof that they did try to do their work they just couldn't do their work. So um, the, the avenue that we have with, with the report of that, uh, Ms. Rowe, is that uh, the, student, the student should bring that device back the next day and, and report that to their teacher. Uh, with, with fidelity, um, I, I will say that I, in my classroom, I would have believed a student bringing that back. I mean, technology is a wonderful thing, but every once in a while it will do something that, that we don't want it to. So like, I think it's the on the cloud that she's having trouble with is sometimes. So we, well, we've yeah, let, let, so the device to the doesn't protections show. as well. Well, so the let, let me, that we have let me kind of walk into a there's, a, there's a fine line that we walk every day. Mm -hmm. And that fine line is this, in school, uh, our filtering process is, um, it, it's robust, it's strong, but when we get the kids home, we have changed the way that they're using the filter at home because we can't guarantee every day that, that there's going to be as much oversight as we provide in the building, okay? So what that causes us to have is we have a, a restrictive filter by choice because on one hand, we want to have our children have access to the things that they need, but on the other hand, we're trying to keep them safe and secure from things that they shouldn't be on. So 
we, we can balance that either direction by opening the filter up so there's more access to the things. The, the, the issue then becomes that I'm going to get more reports that students are gaining inappropriate access. So we are constantly walking down the line of is it access or is it protection? And so um, my staff is very responsive to, to schools. Um, we had an issue last year um, with one of our, our elementary schools where we went to, and met with the parents to work through how we could do filtering better. That is, that is our role and responsibility to be responsive to, to parents when it comes to, to filtering. And, and I'll be honest, I would love to have kids be able to access everything they need to, but with a mechanical filter that's making decisions based on a, a set of, of rules, um, I, I want to err on the side of caution so that we don't end up exposing our kids to you know, inappropriate things on the internet. So does that explain why she's always trying to use our home computer to do her work instead of her device? Yes. Yep. So it has to do with what network you're connecting on? Well, and so our mobile filter actually has a, a uh, we've applied a mobile filter that is strengthened for the home use and that is not on your local machine. We've decided to err on the side of safety and so those, um, we do, that the filtering system makes makes it so that it's mm -hmm. difficult for them so, to access certain things at home. So one um, of the, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, mm -hmm. Mrs. Wyman, my apologies. Uh, one of the, one of the added bonuses of um, the superintendent's presentation ar around Chromebooks is that when we go to roster our, our students for the Chromebooks, that's also going to issue Google accounts to our to our students. So when we talk about kids, uh, Mrs. Hannah and I have spoken about Google access for kids. How do I get to Google Drive? How, we're going to have a much safer, secure environment around Google Drive that students will be able to access and, and gravitate to if that's their choice, or they can connect to their OneDrive. So we'll have option and choice. And so um, I, I really believe with our Chromebook presentation, or Chromebook pre, um, proposal, Losing my words this evening, sorry. Um, we, we're going to have a much wider gamut of access for kids that's still in a safe and secure environment. Okay, thank you. Ms. Adekoya, was your question answered or do you have another question? Yes, my question is answered. Um, it was just around the fact that students always complain. They will say that when they get home. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It, the big misconception was that it was a Wi-Fi issue, but through talking through you and the guy at um, Mr. Schoology, Ford? yes, <laughs> I believe so. And um, Mr. Rob? Yes, I understand now that it's not more of a Wi-Fi connection issue, it's a filter issue. I'm able to tell students that it's a filter issue. And, and so just, just so we can, and uh, I'm, I'm quite cognizant of the time, so I'll finish it up with this one. Um, I would also also like to say that while we understand that, that a home network is something that is widely varied, um, we, we're constantly in, in investigation to make sure that we have access and speed. So we have staff who take home student devices and check on their home. So um, if you have specific things that, that, that are really of concern, then please bubble them up through them. We'll, you know, because what, what, I, what I usually run into is, that um, we'll get a report that a student somewhere had a problem and without any um, assignment of blame or anything we just need to know who that that student is so that we can go and directly say this device has a th something that we can investigate and maybe fix a wholesale so okay thank you excuse me uh, mr. McMillian and then mr. Kuhn and then we're gonna move on to the next yeah. segment I retired from Baltimore County High School on November 30th. I'm aware the teenagers were downloading Peace Siphon. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I don't understand, and everybody, nobody can answer why can't we eliminate that? Uh, you know, they, they get rid of it. You know, somebody discovers they have it, that we clear it. Within minutes, they can download it again. Why do we allow that? You want me to take the first stab at this? Uh, if you'd like, Dr. Adams. Um, so one of the things, I remember we talked about this in the Superintendent's um, Safety and Technology Committee, and one of the things that we ensure on our devices is that we can't install things. And so at the, that's sort of a standard, and we thought we were okay. And the um, insidiousness of P-Siphon is that it doesn't have to be installed actually on the device. And so if I wanted to use P-Siphon, I could put it on a flash drive and then put that flash drive in my computer and use it. And I've not installed anything on the computer, so I've not tried to do something to the device that I'm not supposed to do. And so that then becomes more difficult to prevent because we've done the security that says, I can't put a program on here that Mr. Korn says it doesn't belong, but this program doesn't, re um, doesn't require installation to the actual device. So that makes it a little bit more challenging and you probably have a lot more. Well, so I, in a very brief um, statement, Mr. Mayweather, we, we are aware of this, this major concern, okay? So we've actually been monitoring 
in the background how many instances of peas siphon have been running. We do, uh, our current filter software is working very diligently to catch up because as Dr. Adams was pointing out, that is a piece of software that just, it, it changes its name, it changes its layout, it is like watching a mutating virus. So. That's the only thing I can really describe it the best, uh, best as. And so we actually are in, in an active monitoring mode, and we're working with our vendor that to pilot the ability to block a device that has P-Siphon on it for, from connecting to the internet with a warning that says, once you discontinue the use of this software, we'll give you the internet back. Um, so th those are all in pilot phase, and so I don't really have a lot of information I want to be able to share with you this evening until we have more data, but we are well aware of that need. Okay. <laughs> okay, I have Mr. Kuhn and Ms. Hennon. And we're moving on because we do need to start our public hearing. Okay. All right, so um, regarding the filters, yes, sir. Uh, and, and thank you for what you've pro provided tonight. Um, I literally ran into this issue last night with my sixth grader. Uh -huh. um, my, my question is, because it seems like people are figuring this out on their own or they can't do something or what have you, is it, is it clear to all of the teachers what people can and cannot do at home on their laptops with research or whatever else they may need to do so that they're not expecting children to go home with this device and be able to do something that we are blocking. Right. So um, we have worked very diligently through uh, our academic channels to make sure that the things that we support on an everyday basis are uh, un unfiltered at home, easily accessible. and. Um, other than simply saying we have professional development that we provide as frequently as possible to really indicate the, the levels of filtering and the things that can and can't be accomplished, um, that's the avenue that we have for that. And my last, is, is this information available on BCPS so that I as a parent can go and say, okay, all of these sites are, you are blocked when you come home, whereas mm -hmm. you may be able to use them in, in, in the school, but... I don't, I don't currently have a list of block, block sites and, and unblock sites. It's, it would be super Pretty massive. Yeah, but, super unwieldy. But there might be specific ones like Google, for instance, that yeah. people and, want to use all the yeah. time. And so um, I, will, I will be happy to um, take, take back counsel around some of, some of the comments we've had about search engines particularly are a, a one that causes particular I issue. So um, we, have, we have conversed uh, frequently about them, so I'm happy to take guidance on those. And uh, we've, we've got some offerings for teachers that are open and unblocked that uh, we can just reinforce that. All right, thank you. Hey, sure. Thank you very much. Thank you both. Um, and we're going to move on to our next, oh. oh Ms. Hen. Very quick. Thank you, Mrs. Kazi. So to, to follow up, it, it doesn't seem that our current support model um, includes uh, home support or I would like to see more information about how home support fits within this support model okay. and what resources are available to families especially. I know parents have communicated frustration with being locked down to address some of the, the concerns themselves. We have a lot of IT professionals who are, you know, myself included, who are trying to provide support to mm -hmm. students after hours as one line of support. Sure. Um, one consideration might be to balance those permissions out or to consider parent access so that enabling, we've got a network of volunteers who are willing to help out here, parents who are IT professionals who might be able to solve the issue for their, their students. And I know that that's a balancing act with security, but it's something that I would like to hear more on possibly in our steering committee meeting. But also so the um, response by Mr. Corns, I heard you say that if a student has an issue at home, they should just bring the device back to school the next day for it to be addressed. And I don't think that's a sufficient message or response to our students um, to avoid tears at homework time. Sure. This is a very real need for our youngest learners to be able to get the support they need. Many have the advantage of home equipment, many don't. Mm -hmm. And I think we need a solution that provides equitable support to all those with their own personal devices in the home and those without and telling them to bring it to school the next day and putting that burden on them knowing they haven't completed their homework yeah. for the night. That can be traumatic for our, our youngest learner. So I do think we need more information, more resources for parents, mm -hmm. especially who are trying to provide this technical support after hours. If the expectation is devices are going to be used in the home, then we need to provide more support to our students to sure. do so. Sure. So Mrs. Hen, I, I will say that uh, given our, our 
committee interactions that we have with uh, uh, the superintendent's uh, safety and technology, uh, I think that would be a great th charge for us to take on to sort out because given your background and the mission critical need of our devices uh, at home, I'm, I'm absolutely open to the idea that we, we could collaborate together to bring forward something. Great. And, and I, I would also point out that our teachers also, for us as a board, to understand what is their support level after hours because we know our teachers and support personnel and administrators are home working in the evenings and on Saturdays. So to understand what is currently available and what uh, are new things that can be worked on to have help desk capability, you know, for that quick call that could save uh, someone an hour or two of frustration. Okay? Sure. Thank you very much. And if we can move on to the next segment. Okay, so I, I, or last but not least, certainly uh, the board asked questions last time, last week, about air conditioning. Um, I would ask Mr. Dixit to give us a very uh, brief overview, uh, given our time, um, but I know that it, it, there are measures that are already in place, and I would just uh, like him to explain those to the board and to the public. Good evening, Chair, Ms. Causey, Vice Chair, Ms. Hen, Superintendent and the members of the board. It's going to be really quick because it's all good news. Uh, for the benefit of the board members that are new, I'll give you a picture of what has happened in the past, where we are right now, and what's our future plan. Back in 2007, when we started with the air conditioning initiative, we had uh, 83 out of 172 buildings. Now keep that number in mind, 83 out of 107 buildings uh, which, were, which were not air, which were 83 out of, which were air conditioned. That left 89 buildings that were not air conditioned. That's a rate of 48.2%. At this time, in 2018, we have 163 out of 174 buildings that are air conditioned. That's 93.7% the buildings are air conditioned. Next year, when school opens in September 2019, we'll have three more schools that will be air conditioned and it'll be 95.4% of the buildings that will be air conditioned. While we have done all of this, there are still five schools and three programs and centers that are not air conditioned. And I'll give you a little bit of planning on those. Colgate Elementary School is under construction and it'll have air conditioning, so in 2020, that'll be an air conditioned building when it opens. Berkshire, which is another building under construction, that'll be air conditioned in 2020. The third building, Bedford Elementary School, that was going to be air conditioned, opening in 2020, but because of the new fiscal reality, it's going to be rescheduled, whether it's gonna be one year or two year, we don't know. So those three buildings are already under construction or design, and they will be air conditioned. There are two high schools, Delaney High School and Lansdowne High School, for, we, for which we had prepared a renovation contract. For Delaney, the board did not vote upon that contract, so it's still the same Delaney that we had before, and the same is for Lansdowne, except that the board did not approve the contracts. So these are the two high schools that are not air conditioned because the renovation contract could not go through, even though all of the design work and the contract of, uh, bid, bidding work was completed. Um, in addition to these five buildings, there are three programs and centers that are not air conditioned, Campfield Learning Center, uh, Kate Newsville Alternative Center, and Old Rosedale Center. The program in the old Rosedale Center has already been moved to a leased building, so they, they are in an air-conditioned environment. A Camp Field Learning Center, the future of that program is being evaluated, and, and there's a good possibility that once, once the Bedford is completed, we'll be able to accommodate that program in that school. And the Catonsville Alternative Center, we are still looking at the future options for that program. So with, the, with this work completed, we'll have ex everything except the two high schools that are not air conditioned. Now what we are doing to take care of the immediate needs, we are doing an analysis as to what we can do during the time that they are not air conditioned. And each building is unique. 
It has different cooling loads. It has different electrical system. It has different needs for ventilation. And it will require different amount of work for lighting, ceiling, in some cases, even site. So our team of engineers are looking at this. They are look, doing an analysis. Once we know, uh, we'll have a better idea of the scope of work that is needed to provide temporary air conditioning. And we'll share the findings of that analysis with the superintendent. With that, if you have any questions, I'll be more than glad to answer. Ms. Rowe. So I just have one question, and I'm assuming because I know you follow things very well that you're familiar with the legislation that passed last year, um, uh, SB 611, which provides um, funding outside of our normal capital requests for air conditioning. And um, I just wanted to know, since Baltimore City has also been going through a similar process for um, putting temporary AC in a large number of their schools, and they're using these um, Mitsubishi split units. If you've made contact with the engineers in the city to see what types of things they went through, because in following the IAC, they sent people all over the country to see different school systems, different school sizes, and how they were doing this. And I'm wondering if we could save time and avoid reinventing the wheel by cooperating with them. Okay, it's a two-phase question. One has to do with the grant or the special program. We have been in touch with IAC. Those funds are not available right now. Uh, they are still in the process of allocating those funds and developing a process for distribution of those funds. So uh, me and my team has been in, in touch with IAC. As late as today, I have talked to them. And as soon as the funds are available, we'll be applying for that. The second part has to do with the type of air conditioning. Like I indicated, that every building is unique. Okay, What works in one building, what works in our home, what works in our office is totally different than what will work in Delaney High School, for example. Each building has electrical system, it has cooling load, it has ventilation requirement, and all of that is designed by the experts. There are there are people in my team and the people outside who are licensed to do just that type of work. And they'll be studying it and coming up with the recommendation. Did I answer a question? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dixit. And I do appreciate um, the work. As we know, we lost three days of instruction at the beginning of this year at all 10 of those schools. And it's really just uh, unacceptable for our teachers who are professionals to operate in these conditions. And, it, and it's uh, been shown that there is a correlation between building adequacy and student achievement. So we need to do what's equitable for our students, what's healthy and what's safe. So I appreciate that we're gonna have this conversation moving forward. I just would like to thank the board for your sense of urgency. You share our sense of urgency as well. Um, as I've always said, um, we want to make sure that we are um, uh, ensuring the health and safety of all of our staff members and our students as well. So we do share in that sense of urgency, which is why we're taking these steps to explore um, how these cooling uh, mechanisms and strategies uh, for all of our buildings. So thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And now the next segment of our meeting is item E, public comment. Good evening. So we... Um, I call to order this segment of the Board of Education of Baltimore County public hearing on the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget. The sign-up sheet was available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. As your name is called, please come to the front table to speak. I will also announce the next speaker's name and ask that person to come to the table and be on deck and ready to provide their comments. Written comments may be given to our executive assistant, Tracy Gover. Um, each speaker will be given three minutes to speak on the proposed fiscal year 2020 operating budget. This public hearing is not the forum to speak on any other topic. I ask you to observe the time to my left and also on the speaker's table, table, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the buzzer or see that your time has expired. 
So this evening, our first two speakers are Abby Baton, president of TABCO, and Missy Fanshaw, principal. Good evening. Welcome. We all there. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Han, Ms. White, and members of the board. I did not bring the big contingent today. They are really busy, so I didn't want to ask them again, but the TABCO Board of Directors is here. We appreciate the time afforded for input for the, uh, into the operating budget. Thank you for scheduling this additional session. The operating budget is at the heart of the needs of our school system. TABCO and ESPBC, along with CASE, AFSME, and OPI, all stand together in our support of the original budget proposal. We understand the budget issues from the county side, but if we don't ask for what is needed, there won't be any funding going towards those needs. Once the budget goes to the county executive, we can all work with him to ensure his budget has the most possible resources included for the school system to move forward. We all understand that cuts will, be, will need to be made, but that should happen at the county level. As a school system, we should be asking for what we need. Just this past weekend, the Sun Papers had an article about the growth in Baltimore County Public Schools. It discussed the diversity changes that have come to our schools with this growth. This, these changes in demographics require supports in place. The influx of speakers of other languages into our classrooms has strained the system because we need teachers and staff to address the differing needs of this population. We have added some new ESOL teachers, but we know we need more. Teachers need the tools and resources, both human and material, to help their students. Letting the county executive and then the county council understand what we need is crucial to go toward obtaining those resources. Teachers, as well as staff, deserve their steps and colas. So many of our teachers, as well as other staff, are working additional jobs outside their jobs in our school system. I watched some of the strike action in Denver this past week and saw a student with a sign stating her teacher was also an Uber driver. Our teachers here should not need to work outside the school system. They have too much to do to give up their precious time driving for Uber or working for Home Depot. The public overwhelmingly supports public education. They are willing to stand with us to work towards full, schools becoming fully funded. We need to take the steps needed to push for what we need for our children. Be bold, pass the original budget as it was presented. Thank you. Now, Missy Fanshawe. Good evening, Ms. Causey, Ms. Hen, members of the board, and Superintendent White. I'm Missy Fanshawe, principal of Rogers Forge Elementary School. I'm also a very proud graduate of Baltimore County Public Schools, mother of three former students, daughter of parents that dedicated years of service to teaching and leadership in this county, and the sister of two former teachers as well. I am here tonight because I am fully invested in Baltimore County Public Schools. I'm also here to speak on behalf of AESA, which is the Association for Elementary School Administrators. AESA fully supports Superintendent White's original budget that takes a look at increasing special education, ESOL teachers, people for our people, the cost of living adjustment with step increases, and continuing to provide students with devices that will support the imperative need for them to access technology with our STAT teacher support. As the principal of one of the original 10 Lighthouse schools, I have seen over the past five years the tremendous positive impact technology has had in preparing our students to become globally competitive. During that time, we have seen an increase in our data and student achievement in both reading and in math. BCPS needs to continue to provide equitable opportunities for students across our very large school system to ensure that they have access to all of the tools that they need to learn and be successful. We are very much in support of the original proposal of moving to Chromebooks in elementary schools and two to one device ratio for grades K, one and two while continuing one to one in grades three through five. Having one-to-one -one access is essential for learning in the intermediate grades. Along with accessing the curriculum, students are also held accountable for completing online assessment tests, quizzes, and standardized tests.
I believe that a two to one ratio in grades K1 and 2 is very reasonable for the amount of time spent on the devices at a very young age, giving students the opportunity to work as partners before working independent, in, independently in intermediate grades. The success of our students depends on providing cutting edge instructional practices. If we want to care for and retain exceptional talents, we must provide pay increases for our frontline staff, from bus drivers to additional adult assistants to our teachers. Education systems are large and complex interdependent systems. Each has a critical element that needs to support the other ties. We cannot take a look at one over the other. As Ms. White has said, it is not an either or budget, it must be and. Let's encourage the county executive and governor to do what is right by helping us find the funding necessary to support our schools. We do not do that by withdrawing the original budget proposal. Our children deserve a world-class education. They deserve safe learning environments and the tools to be successful. Our teachers de deserve the dignity of not having to work those multiple jobs to pay their bills. On behalf of AESA and Rogers Forge Elementary School, I respectfully ask to Thank you. And next we have Ann Gorman and then Lori Taylor Mitchell is on deck. Good evening, Ms. Gorman. Good evening. Good evening, Ms. Causey, Ms. Hen, members of the board and Superintendent White. My name is Ann Gorman and I am the principal of Millbrook Elementary School. I have been in the county for over 20 years as a teacher and administrator. I have had the pleasure of working in various areas of the county as well as various educational positions. In addition, I am the proud parent of two girls who are currently BCPS students. I believe that you should support Superintendent White's original proposed budget that includes people for our people cost of living adjustments, and step increases. In addition, you should continue to provide our students with the technology they have been using over the past several years to grow in their global skills, as well as the professional development positions, that's currently STAT teachers, that support our teachers and students in BCPS. Please know that STAT was an initiative, and I believe that these teachers are not getting the accolades they deserve. STAT teachers support our schools in professional development, and that in turn supports our teachers, students, and student achievement. Day-to-day -day embedded professional development for our teachers is essential to help them grow in their profession. As an assistant principal, I had the privilege of being at one of the original Lighthouse schools. I was able to see firsthand the many benefits technology provided to our students, as well as the increase in student achievement. The original proposal of two to one devices in grades K to two will help our county continue moving forward in helping all of our students access the many different resources provided through the digital platform. If we cut the number of devices by any more than two to one in primary grades, we are taking steps backwards. Our student success depends on the continued use of technology. When considering cost of living adjustments and step increases, it is imperative that this not be cut from the budget. There is already a teacher shortage, and by not offering cost of living adjustment or step increases, we are limiting the talented teachers we could be hiring in BCPS. We need and want strong, talented teachers in BCPS. We need and want to retain our current talented teachers. Please don't prevent this from happening by not supporting an increase in cost of living adjustment and step increases. I am urging you to support Superintendent White's first proposal for the 2020 budget. It should not be an either or situation. It should be an end situation. Our students and staff deserve this. Please encourage the county executive to support this budget. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Gorman. And I'll ask Inez Franklin to come up while we hear from Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell. Good evening. Good evening. Yes, I'm Dr. Lori Taylor Mitchell. BCPS has nearly 50,000 students in severe poverty who qualify for free and reduced price meals or farms. Of these, about 43,000 students live in families at or below 130% of the federal poverty level for a family of four, $32,630 per year. 
In Baltimore County, over 40,000 children depend on the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, for food. But over 11,000 children suffering from food insecurity in our county do not qualify for food assistance. Family incomes are too high to qualify, but not enough to buy adequate food. Expanding two proven programs could help thousands of additional low-income students. The Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP, and Maryland Meals for Achievement. Over 8 million students in over 17,000 schools benefit from CEP nationwide. CEP creates hunger-free schools and helps thousands of children and families who make too much to qualify for free meals but not enough to make ends meet. For example, a family of four with an income of $48,000 a year is likely struggling to make ends meet but does not qualify for free or reduced price meals. With about $3 million in funding for CEP, students in over 50 of our high needs schools would no longer worry about food during the school day. Hunger and stigma would be erased. Unpaid school meal debt would be a thing of the past. Students would be better prepared to learn. For less than $1 million, BCPS could fund breakfast in the classroom in 24 schools now on the MMFA waiting list. Thousands of children would benefit at these high poverty schools, an investment with a huge payoff in nutrition and better attention in school, beginning with the most important meal of the day. High school students are not permitted credit or to charge meal accounts. Elementary and middle school students may charge just up to $6. Students without money for breakfast are offered milk and graham crackers. That is not a meal. And more than 80% of low-income kids in just seven of our poorest schools do not access school breakfast. From children pretending to have lunch and, or food in lunch boxes, hoarding food in lockers, to visits to nurses with symptoms of hunger, to name a few, we know there are hungry children in our schools. Regarding support staff, my proposals for 2020 submitted to you previously described adding 45 additional positions for social workers, pupil personnel workers, counselors, and school psychologists as part of a five to 10 year plan to increase staff positions, totaling about $4 million for this year. I would be happy to review these proposals with you. I ask you to consider this reallocation of $8 million for food and support staff to ensure that our school children in poverty have access to sufficient food when in school. Support staff serve all students and cannot do their jobs effectively at current staffing levels. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, well, <clears throat> let me ask Katie Dell to come forward and be on deck while we hear from Ms. Inez Franklin, board member, ESPBC. Yes, good evening uh, to the chair, to the vice chair, to Superintendent White, and to the board. I come before you this evening to implore that you approve Superintendent White's initial budget. The People for Our People budget is a paramount budget that is going to help sustain the success of the school system. The People Capital budget is the basis of your budget. Our ESPBC president, Jeanette Young, has spoken in the past weeks about the need for increased office professionals, paraeducators, health assistants, interpreters, and technicians. It is simple. As the student and professional staff increase, the support staff are needed to support each of them. In addition, as the student population increases, the students' needs are increasing as well. Many of the students entering the school doors have experienced some type of trauma in their young lives. In order to address and support the needs of students, additional professional development is needed. While behavior interventionists and counselors may be the first people you think of when you hear supporting students with behavioral needs, I am here to tell you a title does not make a student connect with a staff person. I ask that you consider increasing training opportunities for all staff so that when they do come upon a student, they will know how to appropriately interact with them. You never know if it's the paraeducator, the interpreter, the health assistant, the office professional, or the technician who is going to connect with that student. As the village molding the students, we all need to deliver the same message and approach, and that happens when we are all trained. In order to adopt a people for people budget, our people need financial compensation for the hard work they do. Accolades are great, but they do not pay the bills. 
30% of ESP employees have been with BCPS for 15 or more years. How would you feel if those who make decisions for the school system say, your contribution is important, but your expertise is too expensive, so we will just not pay you? I implore you to approve Superintendent White's initial budget. Through staffing, professional development, and salary, you will honor the priorities that are needed to sustain the school system and that helps to build a better Baltimore County public school system as well. Thank you. Presented on behalf of Jeanette Young, President, Education Support Professionals of Baltimore County. Thank you. Thank you. And can I ask Diana Bergman to come up while we hear from Katie Dell? Good evening. Good evening. Let's try something real fast before I start. Uh, so in my classroom, I would say, good afternoon, class. And my class would say, good afternoon, Ms. Dell. So good evening, board members and Superintendent White. Good Thank you. Good evening. My name is Katie Dell. I am currently the science department chair at our Butis Middle School. I have served the past seven and a half years in BCPS as a teacher, a team leader, a field trip planner, a budget balancer, a curriculum writer, a department chair, a technology liaison, an equity liaison, a STEAM night coordinator, a green school coordinator, and a tennis coach. And I could add more. This is not about me. My point is that being an effective and involved educator requires a massive skill set. And tonight, I will only ask you one question. Can we afford it? Not can we afford the money, can we afford the cost? Can we afford to lose educators with a skill set like mine? Most importantly, can we, can we afford to lose the future me's of the education world graduating and looking for a job? We cannot. Seven and a half years ago, I graduated from Towson University in search of a county in which to start my teaching career. I would love to tell you that I based my decisions on ethics, progress plans, and the like, but in reality, I based it on finances. I'm the product of public education from one county over. I enjoyed my time there, their curriculum, I adored my teachers, and it's the reason that I'm in the profession today. But that county did not even get a glance at my resume. At the time, that particular county had frozen teacher steps for two years prior, and that trend continued for five more years. Because of that, I overlooked them. So I ask you again, can we afford for graduates and profession seekers to overlook us because of a step freeze? We cannot. Though my choice of county may have been based on finances, I can honestly say that it did not take me long to realize I made the right choice in terms of values. I am very proud to work in a county with a focus on equity and 21st century learning. How many times have we mentioned equity tonight? I've engaged in hours of equity training from which my teachers, students, and our classrooms have benefited greatly. Can we afford to lose that reputation? We cannot. But our actions speak much louder than our words. Devices close our resource and experience gaps in our most at-risk populations. They provide our students with necessary skill sets to be successful in this world and to reduce them to a number that is insufficient would fail to disrupt poverty and racially driven inequities. Finally, in a profession that remains 77% female as of 2017, passing a budget that fails to give teacher increases is nothing more than a perpetuation of the wage gap that has existed in this country for centuries. A failure to provide us with our promised steps and colas is to prey on the nurturing nature of women and men in this workforce because we will always show up. That is not equity. So I ask you, can we afford it? Can we afford a budget that makes us less attractive to those seeking employment? Can we afford a budget that shows we are willing to perpetuate inequity, even though it's one of our core values? We cannot. I urge you to be bold. Pass the original budget that supports our students, teacher, staff, and our core value of equity. We cannot afford any. Thank you. And I'll ask Ms. Cheryl Brooks to come forward while we hear from Diana Bergman. Good evening. Buenas tardes. Yo tuve la misma um, oportunidad para trabajar para el condado de Baltimore County ayudar a las familias hispanas en el departamento de World Language. Um, maybe you guys need an interpreter. I had the opportunity to work for BCPS as an interpreter to serve our families, our ESO families, here in Baltimore County. Um, it is very important. Um, our ESL families, the population is, in, is growing. And for everybody to work together so they could communicate, you have to increase that. You have to increase that support as it grows and support our families and our children and our educators. I have with me something that a lot of people don't know. It's a large print book. 
this is what it looks like. That's ninth grade um, algebra one, ninth grade um, government. Um, and my child needs that to be able to see that. If we take away our stat devices or reduce that, he can't get access to his education. He would have to haul these big, large print books around. And I want to know if you're willing to cut that, then who's going to help him carry those books around? Because I have like 12 of them at home, and I couldn't bring them all in here. You guys could feel it. But compare it to your device that you have in front of you. It doesn't weigh anything, and it gives him direct access in a discreet way that his peers don't know. So I've said this a long time ago, and I'll say it again. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater when you look at this program. I think they did a great review of the way that we could save with the Chromebooks at elementary. I do think third and fifth grade it has to remain one-to-one, -one, because if you reduce that, you have a lot of children that have vision impairments, one out of five children will have problems with um, conversion insufficient. So um, when the muscles in the eyes don't work together, they can't see. And the letters that they try to read jump around. That's what happens to my son. So we've had technology improve the lives of a lot of our children in special education, whether they use a device to communicate or use a device to be able to see the instruction. So think carefully. I think that the original first budget proposal is what our needs are. And I hope you guys go back to that and consider that. Thank you. Excuse me, if I can ask Dr. Cynthia Boyd to come forward. While from Ms. Brooks, good evening. Good evening, distinguished board members and Superintendent White. I'm Cheryl Brooks, a proud principal of Berkshire Elementary. Thank you for visiting. McMillan and Offerman, nice visit. I appreciated having you there. I am the past president of the Association of Elementary School Administrators. We have about 130 elementary administrators who are members, and I'm speaking on behalf of our organization. We fully support and respectfully ask that you submit Ms. White's original 2020 proposed budget to the county executive for approval. As a principal at Berkshire, the STAT initiative has been very beneficial to us in our overall instructional program, including the digital resources, technology, and the STAT teachers who provide professional development and support to teachers in our school. And I'm hoping that's something that our visitors also could see when they came into our building, and we're very proud of that. So I really am, on behalf of our organization, asking that you truly consider the original proposal, because I do think and we feel as an organization it is in the best interest of our students and our staff. So thank you so much. We hope you have a great evening, and thanks for your consideration. Thank you. And if I can ask uh, Ms. Colleen Carr to come forward while we hear from Dr. Boyd. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. I appreciated many of the changes in interim superintendent's budget that is 11% over maintenance of effort. And I hope the BOE passes some version of this budget, as I believe the cost of living and step increases for teachers are essential. I also appreciated the county executive's transparency and honesty about the county's fiscal situation. In light of this, if we are to ask for 11% over maintenance of effort, I hope a greater investment in the people that work with our children can occur. I believe further reductions can be made in the STAT program in order to support the people in our system. For example, adult assistants, who are sometimes referred to as one-to-one -one assistants, perform many vital tasks and help all children in the school building by supporting the needs of children who need them and giving teachers the supports needed to work with all students. And yet, 
uh, in the even in, in both versions of the budget, adult assistants continue to be paid $10 per hour with no benefits and no pay on snow days. Teachers, principals, and parents all know how valuable AAs are. Our ratios of counselors, social workers, and others will still be far below the recommended levels. And actual class sizes, meaning the number of students in classes, not the ratio will, um, that are reported, will still be too large. These are the opportunity costs and we need to right size the investment in technology and put all available funds freed up by cutting back on STAT into our educators. I've been a BCPS parent for nine years and have experienced STAT for all three of my children. I believe there is a role for technology in education. However, my youngest is in first grade right now and I believe fairly compensating our classroom teachers and classroom staff is a vastly higher priority than our having our own device or even one to share with one other student. Please do not increase the number of devices in kindergarten. This is not developmentally appropriate or evidence-based. Please consider less expensive devices for middle school and a three-to-one ratio in first through fifth grade. Please carefully consider which software programs are valued by classroom teachers, parents, and children, and which ones are not used, not useful, or even harmful. The cost of these contracts for iReady, Dreambox, and others are often not counted in the costs, but they should be. In terms of the issue of textbooks, three years ago, my son, who was 11 years old at a time, wrote about the need for math textbooks and came before the BOE with a speech he wrote himself. His name wasn't picked, but his comments were shared by one of the board members later in the meeting. The response from BCPS was that there would be adequate textbooks for everyone to have one in the contract, and the contract was then approved. Thus, I don't understand why having to buy textbooks is now stated as a reason why we can't scale back. Overall, I would like to see more resources is going to the teachers and all the staff that support them in the classroom. Thank you. And while we hear from Colleen Carr, if I can ask Leslie Weber to please come forward and be on deck. Good evening, Ms. Carr. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Hen, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent White. I appreciate the opportunity for public comment. My name is Colleen Carr, and I am a member of the PTA at Pleasant Plains Elementary. I'm also the parent of a first grader, a future Panther who will be in kindergarten this fall, as well as a feisty preschooler who still has two more years before he can follow in his big brother's footsteps at Pleasant Plains. In light of tonight's discussions, I support the efforts put forth to increase instructional and social-emotional supports for BC CPS students, as well as compensation for the individuals trusted to teach and care for our children every day. Budgets are difficult. I don't envy your positions and the choices that you have to make in creating a budget for one of the largest school systems in the county, or country, I'm sorry. I am here to bring a voice to the needs at Pleasant Plains as you move through the budget process. In addition to having the teachers needed for optimal student to teacher ratios, increased funding for special education, English language learners, and social emotional support are critical in order to educate the whole child. My son receives occupational therapy services at school and has made incredible progress over the past year that he's had his 504 plan. We are so grateful for Mrs. Day, his occupational therapist. In addition, we've been thrilled with the new IST, Mrs. McNeve and Mrs. Votlin, our school counselor, who is so incredibly busy, yet always makes the time to check in with my son when he needs it. As the third largest Title I elementary school in the county, appropriate staffing barely scratches the surface of our needs. Despite BCPS projections to the contrary, our actual enrollment data shows a steady increase in enrollment at Pleasant Plains. And I have a copy of a graphic I will leave with you showing that. Pleasant Plains community attracts young families with school-aged children, which is certainly not a bad problem to have. Like many schools, we've been at over capacity for some time, and a few months ago, we topped 700 students. Our most recent enrollment data from January shows our enrollment is still above 700 students, which means that Pleasant Plains is operating at 138% of its state-rated capacity. I would like to take a moment to thank Heidi Miller and Christina Byers for their recent efforts to work with our administrators on short-term staffing relief, as well as proactively advocating for next year's staffing needs. Certainly, these conversations are an important start, but I would argue we must also systematically shift from being reactive and become more proactive. Staffing projections should be grounded in better data that reflects recent and emerging school and neighborhood trends, allowing schools to make better use of the resources outlined in this budget. 
As you address operational needs, I ask that you also keep Pleasant Plains in mind as you consider capital improvement projects in BCPS. We will need adequate space to accommodate the staff that our students need. The current space is undersized for the students that Pleasant Plains serves. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you. And if I can ask uh, Ms. Brenda Pfeiffer to come forward while we hear from Ms. Leslie Weber on behalf of the PTA Council. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Board of Education members, and Ms. White. I'm Leslie Weber, Secretary of the PTA Council of Baltimore County, speaking tonight on behalf of our President, Jane Lee. The decision to create Baltimore County Cares for Kids to offer free breakfast and lunch to students qualifying for reduced priced meals should be applauded, but it doesn't reach many students suffering from food insecurity. Many BCPS students with families living on the edge slip through the cracks. Either their families don't qualify for farms, even though they're barely making ends meet, or perhaps they're afraid to or are unable to fill out farms paperwork. There are 52 high poverty schools eligible to implement the Community Eligibility Provision, or CEP. Thousands of students would benefit from this federally funded program offering free breakfast and lunch to, to all students at eligible schools. If CEP were implemented at the 22 schools immediately eligible, the cost would be about $1 million per year. For the 52 schools eligible through grouping, the cost would be about $3 million per year. The, immediate, the, not, the 22 immediately eligible schools are the Rosedale Center, Stricker, Deep Creek, and Dundalk Middle Schools, and the following elementary schools. Dundalk, Deep Creek, Riverview, Sandalwood, Hawthorne, Halethorpe, Martin Boulevard, Sandy Plains, Berkshire, Logan, Sussex, Bear Creek, Lansdowne, Mars Estates, Halstead Academy, Charlesmont, Chase, and Battle Grove. At these schools, there are so many children at, near, or below the poverty level that it makes sense to offer free meals to all. Nationally, over 8 million children benefit from CEP. All Baltimore City students benefit from CEP. Concerns have been raised about doing away with farms paperwork, but according to No Kid Hungry Maryland and Maryland Hunger Solutions, Maryland's Hunger Free Schools Act protects schools using CEP from losing state compensatory education funding. Federal Title I funding is based on census poverty data, so this funding is not impacted by CEP. Also, the U.S. Department of Education allows for other poverty member measures than farms forms to be used to distribute Title I funding. All students in a CEP school can be considered economically disadvantaged or low income to receive supplemental benefits. Students can receive fee waivers for AP courses, sports, field trips, and graduation gowns, for example. When deciding what to fund in the 2020 operating budget, please consider one of the best and most cost-effective ways to meet the most, most basic needs of the poorest children in our system. Support them by allocating funding for the community eligibility provision. The word community in community eligibility, eligibility provision is key. This is a community-based approach to helping food insecure students and their families. Thank you. Thank you. And can I ask for Mr. Jason Garber to come forward while we hear from Ms. Pfeiffer? Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, I understand that BCPS is hoping to ask the county to fund a budget that is far beyond what the county says it can afford. Though not entirely unprecedented, this budget proposal requests levels of funding that are unusually high, while the county executive is calling on the school system to make cuts. I, of course, will always advise you to take a closer look at the STAT initiative and consider the option of cutting or reducing that budget for all the reasons that I've repeatedly stated. It's very expensive, although how much it's costing is unknown because those specific figures don't tend to appear in the budget documents. There's not very much re research to support it and some research to suggest it's a bad idea. There's very little proof thus far that it's really benefiting our students and it doesn't actually provide equity. With more time, I would love to elaborate on that. Um, now, I know that Ms. White said in her presentation last week that removing or reducing STAT any further would create a burden on our teachers and be too expensive. As STAT has been rolled out, teachers have spoken of the burden of all the changes and the stakeholders have questioned the high cost of the program. But apparently, we're only concerned about burdening teachers and excessive spending when it comes to reducing STAT, not when it comes to implementing it. But there's a bigger issue to address right now. Once informed of the fiscal situation in Baltimore County, Ms. White announced cutting teacher salary increases as a possible solution. Of course, the teachers and the public were outraged at the idea. It's an unpopular idea that no one would support. 
And then, after rationalizing why other budget areas, such as stat or central office, can't be touched, everyone has, presented, has been presented with a scenario in which cutting teacher salary increases or fighting for the full original budget proposal are the only two possible options, but this is simply not true. To you as the board, I say this. Don't be distracted by all the noise created by these announcements and the subsequent outrage. Stay the course. During the budget process, the job of the Board of Education is fiscal oversight. Please go through this budget line by line. Please take the time to review the budget, ask questions, and consider all options. Then send a budget to the county executive that is more in line with what we're likely to receive and that asks for what we really need. Things like smaller classes, plenty of additional teachers and support staff in various areas, salary increases for teachers and support staff. It is the responsibility of the board members and BCPS, not the county executive or others, to determine what this school system really needs. By no means am I saying anything about the county executive's ability to make the right choices. I'm simply saying that the control over and choices about the school system budget belong here at the school system level. Sending a budget request that far exceeds the funding we were told we can expect is irresponsible. Please keep the decisions about what we ask for and what changes are made to the budget here in the school system where they belong. Thank you. Thank you. And if I can ask uh, Ms. Erica Ma to come forward while we hear from Mr. Jason Garber. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. Uh, first, I would like, I would like to adopt uh, and echo the comments um, from Ms. Uh, Lori Taylor Mitchell, Ms. Leslie Weber, and Ms. Colleen Carr. Uh, I am here today as a proud parent of a first grader at Pleasant Plains Elementary School. You may have heard, Pleasant Plains is a Title I school. It is significantly overcrowded. Um, there is a misconception about what that means in terms of Title I funding and everything. It is meant to be a supplement, but it's not meant to supplant funding. And there are significant problems at Pleasant Plains. So the, the overcrowding that you would experience at Pleasant Plains, though, is different than you would experience at other schools. And why is that? Pleasant Plains has 421 of its 702 students. That's 60 percent are farms uh, eligible students. 120 are ESOL students. 28 homeless students. That's an increase of seven alone within this past year. Uh, that is from the start of the year till now. Uh, 96 special education students. That's about 14% uh, there and 17%, which I forgot to mention, for the ESOL students. But what do we have to help address the problems that come with some of these issues and some of the populations that have issues? We have one and a half counselors. We have half a social worker. We have one reading specialist, though our test scores are down relative to other area schools. We have three secretary, or excuse me, two secretaries, when a third is certainly absolutely required. Now, how this all comes out to be a, uh, a particular problem for Pleasant Plains as opposed to other schools. Take, for example, you have a student who's in crisis. That's one out of 702 students. If you have two or three or four students also in crisis at the same time, there is nobody else left to attend to them. There's one and a half, I think, behavior specialists and one and a half counselors and a half a social worker. You're not attending to every student. That is disrupting not only the students who need to have their, um, to have someone attend to their crisis, the kids in the classroom, the other kids in the school, the staff, it, it impacts the entire population within Pleasant Plains. These are different problems that you're gonna confront at Pleasant Plains as opposed to another overcrowded school. There cannot be cuts to anything that relates to social work, uh, workers or counselors. We need to increase funding as it relates to it for Pleasant Plains. And that's just a one school out of all the schools in Baltimore County. So uh, it brings me to another point. I hear regularly how we have to have a bigger voice and we have to be louder. We have, I explained to you the populations of Pleasant Plains. I can't speak for every family that's there, but what I can say is a lot of people do not have the ability to come out and to speak out, and do, they do not have the time, nor they have the resources. The people who have who are ESOL parents, they speak another language presumably as well. Those who have special education kids, they have other things to attend to. So I am here today for my seven-year-old daughter, the 701 other students at Pleasant
thank you. And if I can ask Ms. Linda Gilliam to come forward while we hear from Ms. Ma. Good evening. Good evening. I wasn't going to come today. I spoke at the last public hearing and emailed the BOE last week. But when my son came home from school today, he told me how MAP did not work, again. And how they wasted an entire class period of high school level math, again. Then he tried to record his viola practice on Schoology. The recording went safe. It did before, but now it won't. We don't know why. This morning, he told me that the interview for his oral history project disappeared from his computer under a different, different recording program, after he literally hunted down someone still alive from the Apollo space missions to interview. My son knows how to use computers. He uses Python and Unity to make computer games. And frankly, I don't even know what those are. But he knows computers. And yet a major part of his project is gone from his device. Wasted time, wasted learning, not to mention frustration. So I got on the Beltway, and here I am. Instead of pouring money into STAT, could we please, please take the time to examine each part and make sure it is done correctly, taught and implemented correctly before we continue to throw more at children and waste more time and more learning. I do not want to slow down STAT for the sake of slowing down. I want to slow it down because many of it, many parts of it aren't working well and aren't being taught well. I want to say up front that technology is necessary for our teachers and students. There should be no reduction in technology for teachers. If anything, there needs to be more resources, more training, and especially more reliable internet services. And one of the most valuable parts of STAT for the students is the ability for special education students to access that technology. But there are aspects of STAT that need to be looked at and considered for cuts or adjustments. The move to Chromebooks and one to two in first and second grade is a good first step, but it's clouded by the move for kindergarten to one to two from one to five. I have a better solution to the concern that teachers have to have four groups instead of because of the ratio of students to devices. Let's change the ratio of students to adults instead. More teachers, more aides, smaller class sizes for our youngest and most impressionable children. If money is to be spent on tat, STAT, we need to see that's being spent on health and safety concerns. As a parent, I continue to be concerned with screen time for my children, and it needs to be considered in the classroom as well. Damage to children's vision, hearing, posture, and emotional well-being is increased by increased screen time. And BCPS is willfully adding to that screen time and not monitoring its safety. There are requirements for students to be on Dreambox and iReady, and yet there are no requirements for font size and volume. There is very valuable curriculum online. Tumble Books has access to thousands of books, including ones in Spanish. That's not something I want taken away. But what I could not glean from the budget is how much money is being spent directly on programs being used in schools. Many certainly have potential, but has there been a study to see exactly how often they are used and how successful they are in helping students learn? I've yet to speak to a Spanish teacher or student who have actually used Middlebury. My children learn to touch type on a free program. How much are we spending on edutype that is simply thrown at children and not used properly? Thank you. For Hello. Thank you, and if I can call uh, Mr. Adam Sutton forward while we hear from Linda Gilliam. Good evening. Hi, good evening. My name is Linda Gilliam, and I hold a position that um, I've only heard mentioned in here once or twice. I know that you all know that schools start with a principal, APs, administrators, social workers, but I'm here to represent um, my position, and my position is an additional assistant. Um, I've, I'm assuming that the board doesn't know what an additional assistant is because of what we're paid. Um, we're the, we are the people who um, sometimes have to take your child to the bathroom if anybody has special ed children. Um, I work in a high school with, with students who are high school age, but some of them have um, elementary, um, education. They can't, they can't read, some of them can't write. Um, but I'm the person that that's there to help the teacher, the person that's there to um, work with your child. I'm the person that um, works as hard as the teacher does, even though she's the teacher and I'm the AA. I've heard people here speak about poverty. Baltimore County Public School is paying its AAs um, below poverty um, 
wages. I have here my W-2, and for 2018, I made $12,000. Um, I have a paycheck here that for two weeks, I made $184. I challenge anybody here to try to live um, off that amount of money. When school is closed, we're not paid. I have um, a calendar here of all the days that school is closed, all the days that it's closed for inclement weather when I'm not paid. So I'm, I'm asking you to do the right thing. Um, Baltimore County is, pays its AA's lowest wages than all other schools, all other counties. And it's not right and it's not fair. It's unconscionable. This job is done by 98% women who also have car payments, um, rent, uh, food, children. So um, the, the, the person who works in the cafeteria who just puts food on the plate for your child makes more than I do. They have a union. You guys consider us at, at will temporary employees. And I'm just asking that um, you, you do something about our pay. $10 an hour is not, is not sufficient. It's not fair. And Ask Wendy Cunningham to come forward while we hear from Mr. Adam Sutton. Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Adam Sutton. I am a BCPS teacher and a BCPS parent. Um, thank you guys for hearing me out tonight. Um, it's a pleasure to be with you guys. So over the last um, couple weeks, I've been thinking about a lot of things, and I've been trying to think about myself in your shoes. Um, and the mantra last week after last week's meeting was uh, to ask big. I, I wasn't necessarily sure about that when I left last week, but um, as I thought this week about what you guys should do, you should ask big. Um, you guys are the ones that are responsible for being the cheerleaders for all the people here tonight um, that have kids and that work in this system. You're our, you're our cheerleaders. You're the ones that can go forth and talk about what we need. But if you're going to ask big, you also got to think about the programming that you're supporting with those dollars. All right? Ask big. Ask for a longer school day. Do it. We always talk about having more time for the arts. We talk about having more time for developing kids' social and emotional well-being. Well, let's ask and make sure that we have more time. Uh, let's go out and ask and make sure that we have the lowest uh, counselor to student ratio in the state. Let's ask big. Let's do that. Because I'll tell you what, as a middle school teacher, those counselors, I, I don't know what we would do without them on a daily basis. Uh, you're going to ask big, make sure you support the teachers and pay them what they said, what they need and what they've been agreed to. There have been a lot of speakers that have done a lot better job about, than me talking to that point tonight. Listen to them. The support staff, you just heard it. The support staff is vital. Support them. The programming is what makes this big ask important, okay? So go ahead. Ask big. But think about the programs that you are supporting with that big ask. Uh, I thank you guys for humoring me tonight. I appreciate you listening. And I thank everybody in this room, uh, board members, Superintendent White, and everybody behind me for all the service and commitment they have to this community. Thank you guys very much. Thank you. And if I can ask Lily Lee to come forward while we hear from Wendy Cunningham. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board members. Superintendent White. My name is Wendy Cunningham and I am the proud principal of Gunpowder Elementary School. I am here in support of Superintendent White's initial budget that she brought forth. In her proposal, our leader noted that this year's budget still has a significant request with regard to people for our people, to provide the staffing and resources to ensure that our educators and students are successful. I share in my leader's belief that every child and adult in our BCPS family deserves the opportunity to experience success in their current role within our school system. Throughout my career, 
It has been my priority in my classrooms and my schools to cultivate a warm and welcoming environment in which children and adults feel safe and believe that they are valued human beings. As building leader, I am present, I listen, I learn, I challenge, I teach, I connect, and I influence. I understand that I have the power to empower or to disempower individuals with my words, my actions, my facial expressions, my decisions. As principal, I am asking for you to partner with me in communicating to our people their value. I know that adults who feel valued will pass this positive mindset on to our children. Adults who feel connected and loved will connect to and love our children, be present with them and hear them. This is priceless. It is how we prevent unlikely events from occurring and how we ensure a peaceful and unified Baltimore County for today's citizens and the future citizens who are attending our schools each day. I believe that in order for our children to all graduate from high school, college, and career ready, all of our adults and children must be able to answer yes to, am I safe, am I loved? Then, and only then, will they be in an executive brain state to ask, what can I learn? There must be a willingness to learn, a self-driven desire within all of our adults and children in order for them to learn necessary skills and strategies to keep moving forward. Connectedness leads to willingness. So as principal and parent, I come to live by the words of Maya Angelou, do the best you can, and when you know better, do better. I am here to ask you, our board, our advocates, to do what is best for children. We must send the message to our adults, to our people, those who influence, that we are with them. We are the people for Thank you. And if I can ask Shay Savoy and Jonathan Holtzman to come forward while we hear from Lily Lee. Good evening. Dear BOE members, my name is Lily Lee, a parent of BCPS students, and I have some requests for 2020 budgeting. Number one, have adequate staffing, including filling up the vacant positions of assistant principals, adding more counselors and social workers. They are essential to maintain the health and safety for our kids. Especially now, a lot of schools have students' behavior and discipline problems, and we need to have enough eyes and hands to watch out and control the system. Number two, have very basic infrastructure repairs. We need to fix the very basic broken bathrooms, th toilets, sinks, and water fountains for our children to have uh, <coughs> comparable living conditions of jail inmates, at least. Number three, increase budget for bus transportation. We need to dramatically increase bus drivers' pay, and this is the only solution to hundreds of bus drivers' shortage. And the best courtesy to say thank you and show respect to working in harsh environment bus drivers. Also, we really need more and more buses to provide safe students to bus seats ratios. Number four, try to reduce the school overcrowding problem. Number five, central administration's budget increase should be reasonable, but not be over it too much. Number six, cut the wasteful program to save money to reallocate re to essential areas. For example, for BCPS1 application, the new feature of psychology is a totally disaster to us parents. It's very difficult to explore, and it's very user unfriendly. All the parents I talk to hate this hate this new application. My husband and I simply don't check it anymore. We like the old application better. So my question is, maybe BCPS paid a lot for this crap new application, and it's totally a waste of money. We should stick to the old system and pay less. It's the same philosophy to the pre-K and the K little kids. It will be totally a waste of money to give them a laptop for each and install a lot of software that they don't use or they don't need to use. It's a lot of, uh, to a lot of parents, we simply think pre-K and K kids should focus on team activity and play time, but not machine oriented. A laptop each will only train them 
to be machines when they later on grow up. The savings from here or there add up and can be used for critical areas and minimize the budget problem. Baltimore City Public Schools always cry like a wolf for more, more, more money, and they get more, more, more money. But look at what kind of mess the Baltimore City Public School is. So my saying is only accountability can manage the budget. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Good evening. Um, Welcome. My colleague and I raced over here from Woodlawn High School. I don't have any fancy typed speeches to deliver. Um, we got notice today that the meeting was, the public comment period was tonight. Um, I had drama club after school. I'm the co-advisor of the drama club. And then we had uh, report card conferences. And then I ran home to put on my red shirt and eat my dinner of dried mango because that's all I had time for, and to race across the city to come here. And I tell you this because this is the passionate commitment of our teachers. This is what it means to be a teacher. And we didn't become teachers to amass wealth. We know that the, the, this isn't the right line for that, but we still have to pay our bills. And we give ourselves fully to our work at Woodlawn High School, where we are working with a team of dedicated teachers to transform the narrative. And um, we have a high turnover rate. We hire about 25 new teachers a year. And a part of that is because they don't have adequate compensation. But we are working hard to meet our ambitious goals for equity, and we are well on our way to increase the literacy and numeracy levels at our high school by two grade levels this year because of our dedicated teachers. So we need to increase, or excuse me, maintain our step increases in our COLA so that we can keep this dedicated teacher force who give our entire selves to this work. And I wanted to add further comments, um, urging the board to support the superintendent's original proposal, but as we do so, not to overlook little pieces of the puzzle. Um, previous individuals um, who have come to speak tonight uh, raised the importance of making sure that all adults who work for this system feel valued. Um, so we heard some very moving testimony from um, adult assistants, um, and I think that it's vitally important that we look to support those individuals in AA as well as paraeducator roles. Um, if you want to look for a way to increase a teacher's efficacy in the classroom, you need to make sure that people are coming as paras and as AAs. They do so much to make the teacher's job possible, feasible. In these large classes where I have 31, 33 students, some of whom may not speak English well, a number of whom may have IEPs or 504s, it is absolutely vital that um, there are other adults in the room who can provide additional support. Furthermore, um, it may surprise the board to hear that um, roughly 25% of our students don't arrive until 30 to 45 minutes after um, the first period bell. That is because of staffing issues related to the uh, transportation. I strongly urge you to continue supporting paying uh, bus drivers as well because the impact that has on our students. Thank you. We want to thank each and every uh, community member that came out this evening to give their comments to the board. The board has received hundreds of emails and we have read them and we have uh, listened and we do want to deliberate and do what is best for the system. So we do appreciate um, everything that we've heard. Uh, there is still an opportunity before the budget is voted on on Tuesday, February 19th. You can email the board. The easiest way is to email boe at bcps.org. The last announcement is uh, the next board meeting is Tuesday, February 19th, 2019 at 6.30 p.m. here in Greenwood Building E. And with that, our meeting is adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>